Hello and welcome to another evening of Cooking with Bryson. Our guest today is Dan Tentler, AKA This. Um, the charity for donations tonight is the National Bailout. It's a collective of Black-led and Black-centered uh, abolitionist organizers, lawyers, and activists building a community-based movement to support our folks and end systems of for trial, detention, and ultimately mass incarceration. These are the people who've been impacted by cages, either by being in them ourselves or witnessing our families and loved ones be in caged. We are queer, trans, young, elder, and immigrant. Um, Phobos will be matching the first $3,000 in donations. Um, the link is off of the recipe page on the GoToStage site. Um, DM us if you want to remain anonymous or post online tagging us so that we can make sure that we get that match for you. Um, Dan. Hi. Great. Yeah, we're going to do, hopefully I don't set myself on fire. I had originally suggested Crepe Suzette with the expectation that I may actually set myself on fire, but we'll see. I, I, uh, I don't think I have any, no, I'm pretty sure I have no Grand Monier, so I think that might actually be out. Uh, that's all right. You know, let's just give the people what they paid for, all right? If you set yourself on fire, we'll just consider it a bonus. <laughs> all right. Great. So, uh, I have done nothing. I have, there's no mise en place or anything like that. I literally just plunked my laptop down in the kitchen and stuck my webcam up on the fridge with a magnet, and uh, we should get started. So, I am one of those crazy people that went and paid a guy to make me a bunch of custom stuff. So, I have... We're not going to be using the fork, but I have expensive kitchen toys. Um, so, uh, I, uh, for the uh, sake of, for, I forgot logistics. Uh, if you have questions to ask anything as we're going along, just throw them there at the bottom in the question and answer, and we will get to them. Sorry, back to you, Vis. No, it's all good. I'm uh, I'm still looking at the interface. I have to glance uh, at it once in a while. What I also expect. Tonight? What are we drinking as we as we cook? Ah, good call. Um, I have this stuff. I apologize for the backwards text. I, I'm not sure how to turn that off and go to meeting. Um, I think it comes from the same, I think it's William Smith Vineyards, uh, the same people that make Velvet Devil. Uh, I have a bottle of that too, but why I, why I think they come from the same place, but this is a Charles Smith wine. Sorry, Charles. I don't know if they're the same. I can't tell. No, this has got to be different because these guys are in California. So I don't know who makes this. It's not these guys, despite the fact that their iconography is similar. Um, and by the looks of it, uh, I'm behind. Let's do that. while I slowly but efficiently destroy my kitchen. <laughs> okay. All right. I can't tell how many people there are. Uh, in the, well, attached to the call. Thousands of this, thousands. Attendees. Oh, here we go. Focus on your wine. I'm working on it. No, the great part is that we get uh, pretty good uh, participation during the show. Um, and then uh, we throw it up on the page with all of the other channels for everybody that we've been doing this with every week. Cool. So, um, what whoever misses it tonight will catch up with you in posterity. <laughs> nice. All right. Going and allowing all the bizarre random IP addresses through Little Snitch as they keep coming up from GoToMeeting is going to be a fun thing to try and do while drinking and cooking. There. All right, sir. Cheers. Cheers. Well. As advertised, it's just juice. <laughs> okay. So, <clears throat> we're doing first. What, what I did last time that worked out really well 
was <clears throat> you know how your first scrape is always fucked up like every single first scrape, every single time you can't get around it uh what i did last time which was a terrible mistake don't do this is i tried to i did the um uh shallots and mushrooms uh, i did the sauce first in the uh skillet and then uh try i uh, moved it aside into a separate container and then tried to deglaze the skillet with um crepe batter and that didn't yeah, work that doesn't at work. all <laughs> no <laughs> um, <do> that. <laughs> yeah well, so yeah uh, don't do that because it doesn't work uh so in this case um for the sake of like the camera being able to see i took my gigantic ridiculous cutting board and i put it on the cooktop so that i have like it's in view of the camera so i will do all of my uh topping first and since i literally have done nothing i have to rinse some of these all right so uh what are we chopping what are we what are we putting together here uh so i'm gonna do uh i'm chopping my mushrooms first and i still need to get the um shallots out so it's mushrooms and shallots first so i think the recipe says basically you sweat everything uh, and then once it looks like it's ready, then you chuck in your, um, I think Alton Brown's video, he deglazes with milk and then chucks in flour to thicken it. Uh, cause I think you start it with butter. So I'm going to do that, but I need to give these a quick rinse and I need to grab the shallots and then I will get underway. Okay. Um, I, instead of shallots, I am doing mine with uh, sweet Vidalia. Um, well, <laughs> may have misplaced them. All right, well, I don't know where they went. Hey, this is Hacker's what? Kitchen, man. Just hack as you go. Make it up. Well, I got I got my backup with the yellow onion, but. I know, shallot sa sounded fancy, but yellow onion, any onion, it always works. Ah, except for red onions. You can't do this with red onions. It's not that the flavor is necessarily off, but just they turn gray and gray. <laughs> Great ingredients in your food never looks good. You know, it's super bizarre. Where the fuck did they go? <laughs> my onions have gone in my A. Or, yeah, shallots in my A. No, here we go. I found them. All right. I, I tend to prefer shallots because it's like cheating. They're like, shallots are cool because it's like if uh, they're the, the bastard offspring of a, a garlic and an onion. So you get some garlic flavor in there too. Which is why I am adding garlic. <laughs> Yeah, same, same idea. Just... I can't do anything without garlic, so I add garlic to everything. That's oh god, the holy trinity: butter, garlic, onion. You never yeah, I'm, wrong. I'm in the same boat. I have a, uh, like multiple tubes, those tubes of garlic. I got that, um, and then just like garlic hanging around, and more garlic hanging around, like. Ordinarily, I'd invite the vampires in, but they might be afraid. Once you invite them in, the garlic doesn't work. Don't you remember uh, Lost Boys? Oh, my God. You know, Alex Alex Winter uh, gave me some shit on Twitter about that. I, I watched it recently, and I, I tagged him, and I was like, hey, are you bringing that hairstyle back? And he retweeted me saying, like, fucking never. <laughs> like his bizarre like high top mullet thing that he had going on in that movie um i'd completely forgotten that alex winter was in that movie like when i think of alex winter i think of bill and ted and now the panama papers but like uh it's one of these like you catch the movie and there's a dude in it that you remember from other things and you're like holy fuck this guy's in that there's a lot of that happening these days with uh over being overstimulated. Um, all right. All right. So I have a thing that I use in the kitchen a lot. That uh, was a gift from my wife Sally. It was this bowl that's shaped like a brain. Mm -hmm. And uh, since that makes me think of that scene in Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, where the you know desserts. What's oh, yeah. for desserts? Monkey oh, brain. brains. That's right. Yeah. Uh, except we use. I didn't know this was going to turn into '80s movie references night. Well, we're both nerds and we're both drinking and we're both cooking, so that's tend that tends to be where these things sort of end up. 
organically. Um, but yeah, so this tends to be a, uh, I end up using this as like a detritus collection bowl and I use it literally every single time I cook. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's really handy because the kitchen that I'm in, so I'm in this dinky like two bedroom townhouse, at least until You're we move. California. I, well, I live, I live in a specific part of San Diego that the, the closer to the water you get, the smaller the places get and the more expensive they get. Now, we're yeah. not very close to the water, but we're in a decent spot. So uh, the size is kind of small. The problem with this kitchen, though, is that like this is the, there's only one way in and one way out. There's like a choke point. So the kitchen gets really crowded really fast. Um, and the trash can is outside of the kitchen, which means if there's two of us or three or four of us in the kitchen cooking, the logistics of like not bumping into people or accidentally stabbing someone or accidentally knocking something over that's boiling or something get really wild really fast. So like mm -hmm. having a, a thing that you can cache your your trimmings in so you don't have to like bump into anybody or mess with anyone or run anyone over or anything like that is super fucking handy. Um, but fortunately, uh, the new place has a much more interesting kitchen. So if you ever make it out again, if, if um, Wild West Hacking Fest comes back to San Diego and like people actually roll out, then uh, I'm pretty sure I can have possibly six people cooking in my new place at the same time. So that'll be an interesting thing to experiment with. When do you move into the new place? Well, I bought it a month ago. And uh, when I when I first walked in, um, the, oops, the place was uh, uninhabitable because it's, it reeked of wet dog. So $17,000 later, I'm having new floors installed. And wow. uh, yeah, and the, there was a huge weight state because apparently the previous owners had like this tile that they put in most of the second floor. And to, to have the tile match so that I didn't have to completely redo the entire second floor um, took a little bit of sleuthing because apparently they discontinue it or they discontinued it rather. Um, and getting that tile like 800 bucks of it, like just for like a corner of the room, uh, took two weeks. So if there's no floors in the place, I can't really start moving in. And the garage is being used by the people that are doing all the install. So I'm basically everything's all in pause until the new floors go in. So, so just a uh, trick on the shallots to peel them. If you if you blanch them in boiled water, you pop them right up. Ah, just um, future future reference. Um, and uh, we've already had somebody since we were talking about uh, '80s movies that Bill and Ted face the music, aka the wait, what's after a sequel? The the trequel? <laughs> that's yeah. uh, that's gonna be coming out. Yeah, I saw that they released a new trailer yesterday. Of course they did, because yesterday was Bill and Ted Day. Really? Yeah. You didn't know this? I had no, Bill and Ted has a day. All right. So, Bill, <laughs> I mean, uh, this, um, what is Bill and Ted's favorite number? Oh, fair enough. Yep. Okay. I get June it. 9th. Yep. Or oh, I saw some memes. <laughs> I saw some memes. Um, uh, what was it like something about 69 and 420 happening in the same year or 420 well, I mean, both, both of those days happen every year i don't i don't get how the two go together uh i'm working off of memory which is impaired at the minute hold on a sec okay. Please see right. a fan on. <laughs> not, don't touch your faces when you're cutting shallots man not as bad as jalapeno, not as bad as ha uh, peppers, but still not good. Oh, dude, I had Manzano fermentation brine in both of my eyes for most of the night the other night because. Oh, uh, I, I'm aware. I still have it on my ceiling. <laughs> oh, I, uh, you, you, I, I should get the camera. There, a new reminder to Dan Tentler. <laughs> yeah. Um. Why so don't you tell that story while we're uh, while you're chopping? Oh, uh, tell yeah. The, the, tell us about the guinea pigs who learned. Uh, so yeah, the, the TLDR is if you're gonna make fermented hot sauce, um, like 
you actually have to actively do stuff to stop the fermentation process because if you don't act actively stop the fermentation process, it doesn't stop fermenting. And if it continues to ferment, then uh, you get a pressurized vessel. And depending on that vessel's ability to deal with said pressure, um, it may or may not survive. And in my case, the um, the vessel survived, but it turned into like a bloated, like this rotund thing instead of a, 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 a what do you call it, a, a cylinder. And uh, contents under pressure. And uh, when when opening it, all that pressure wants to get out. And if you look at it when it's having been fermented, I may have posted a couple of pictures of these, so anybody wants to go and scroll back through my pictures on Twitter far back enough. But um, there's little keep bubbles. Cutting. Keep cutting while you tell the story. Oh yeah. Well, I gotta wash these things. Um, prep and talk. Prep and talk. Prep and talk. <laughs> what? Prep and talk. Oh yeah. Um, can you hear me over the sink? We can hear you. Oh, so, um, the problem with sending stuff under pressure is that environmental conditions are going to affect how bad of a time your recipients have. So, if you send if you send somebody fermented hot sauce that's not done fermenting, then what you get is the equivalent of like if somebody shook up a soda can and opened it, you get that spray of soda, except instead of soda, it's hot sauce. Um, yep. So it's very I colorful. I attest to this. Nope sauce version one. Yeah. Yeah. The uh, by far and away the the hottest of the bunch. Um, oh yeah. I uh, I used it in uh, the barbecue sauce I made with uh, Dave Kennedy last week for his. Hack and Dave famous smoked wings. Oh, that's cool. I imagine you probably didn't need a whole lot. You only need a couple drops. Yeah, it is. It is burly. Um, I, and I still my, remember that conversation with you. I was like, so uh, this is pretty spicy. And you're like, yeah, I like, you know, and you told me how you made it. I was like, a lot more mango, a lot less pepper. Yeah. Yeah, that was a the first go around, which... I'm, hey, I'm pleased that it was experience. What? It was a learning experience. It yes, very much so. Yeah, without without a doubt. Oh my God. The only time we stop learning is when we're dead. <laughs> well, if you're doing it right, um, there is a demographic of people I have discovered who are totally cool making it look like they're learning, but aren't. Oh yeah, what, what's, that? what's that about? Um, well, they largely exist in large companies, but you've probably <laughs> encountered them in your career, where they're like, "Oh, I can't help you with the thing because I need to get approval from another department," or "Oh, you need to fill out the requisite forms," or uh, "Oh yeah, um, the person that needs to help you with that is on vacation or on sabbatical." I'm not coming back for six months so that like deadline you have you're fucked mm -hmm. or yeah they they uh you know that like oh god the, the gruck posted it a while ago it was this um cia 1945 or 1955 document there's like a book that got scanned the pdf that was like how to do passive sabotage and they talked about like yeah. turn everything yeah. into it a was community like, it was like corporate management 101 yes exactly yeah that's yeah that was where i was going it's like when I read that thing for the first time, I'm like, holy shit, this is like every big company I've ever worked in. Like, I wonder what would happen if I started showing this thing to like executive leadership and saying, how can you validate that not, or how can you validate that there's anybody on your staff that isn't clearly working for the CIA because they're following this playbook to the letter, which has been, so that, it's time. Is, that, is that your fear that CIA controls corporate America? No. <laughs> I'm teasing, man. I'm teasing. No, no, no. no for, for the CIA to control corporate America, that would infer that the people who work in corporate America are competent enough to be an asset. And I don't think that that is the case. Ah, <laughs> pretty harsh language, sir. <laughs> well, I've been screaming about people that do the fake it till they make it thing for 
a lot of years at this point, so I don't think that's much of a secret. <laughs> well, that's why you started your own company. That is true. That's that's actually how you and I first met. Yeah, yeah. The 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 boggling lunacy of of uh, rule sets that exist to perpetuate the status quo that nobody will ever put in a book out of fear that their investors will get angry about it. Uh, I don't, I don't, I wouldn't be that cynical about it. I think that just oh. nobody's ever put this stuff together. Oh. Um, cause I, I actually gave a talk two months ago that I'm starting to redux on all of the ups and downs of starting your own company from ideation through raise, through whether to raise or not, through what actually does it mean to run a business? And here's the seedy back end of it. Uh, that is handy to know. Um, in the four and a half years that Phobos has been around, um, I have been invited to and gone to several of these like uh, startup something somethings. Um, <laughs> yeah, those are those suck. Well, the funny thing about them is that there tends to be next to nothing in the content of those meetups that talks about anything other than raising VC money. So when I say like, how, how do I orchestrate having a bank account that wants, or a corporate bank account that wants a physical address to an office without having a real office, when the bank says you can't use a PO box, but you know full well that the minute that you put your personal stuff on your articles of incorporation, you're gonna get bombarded with spam forever on your personal phone and your, your home address. Like nobody has any answers for me. All they wanna, all they wanna know is, so you're kind of tripping some counterterrorism with under counter money laundering things. Oh wait, are we uh, are we melting butter? You you got to tell me these things, dude. Oh, sorry. Tell tell us what to do. Talk to us. Don't okay. don't uh, bitch about I, the bank. I'm just heating up the skillet. I'm getting the butter melted because my next step is I'm gonna take all the stuff that I just chopped that's hiding behind the flour, which I should move. Um, uh, I'm gonna take all the stuff that I just chopped and I'm gonna get it going. Um, All right, the the hey, what if we made the filling in another pan at the same time? So they were both sort of like going in parallel. You can, sure. I'm doing it. I'm a wild man. <laughs> you can't stop me. I'm not your dad. I don't make the rules. <laughs> Actually, I'm paid to. I'm paid to bypass the rules. As an interesting point in fact. Point of fact. So, all right, that's a great question. Um, besides your clearly conspiratorial and anti-authoritarian nature, um, <laughs> what got you into hacking? <laughs> that's a funny story. Um, it always is. <laughs> um, did you have you ever installed Red Hat, like the original Red Hat before they split to Fedora, like in the nineties? Yes. Okay. Yes. When I was, oh my God. So in nineteen ninety four. I was like 14 or 15 years old. Um, I, I, yes, I think you're about my age. Yeah, I just turned 40. So, yeah, but um, yeah, I, uh, that's a really annoying, brighty, that's weird, my camera, that's my camera. I don't know why, what it's doing with the brightness, but anyhow, um, yeah, the, uh, the installation for Red Hat had two options. Option one was everything. Option two was manually go through and pick every single package on a per package basis that you want to install, which precipitates the need to know what all those packages are and what they do. And as a 14 or 15 year old kid, I had no clue what bind was. I didn't know what Apache was. I had no idea what any of this stuff was at all. So you got into hacking because of poor documentation? Oh, uh, technically, yes. <laughs> I just, as soon as you said that, that crystallized in my mind and it was just too good to let it go. Yeah. All right. So what are you doing? You are. I'm sauteing the shallots. Okay. So I'm doing that for my filling. Yeah. Wait, so you're going to be doing your sauce in one pan and then you're going to follow up afterward with uh, the crepe? Yeah. What, t what I tend to do, because this is, this is the nicer. Uh, skill that we have at the minute. Um, 
when the, when the filling is done, I'm going to put it into a separate container, and then I'm going to take this thing into the sink for a second and scrape out all the, or well, yeah, I'm going to uh, get out all the leavings. Um, <laughs> you sure you don't want to do it my way, where you're not contaminating the pan? I can, but I don't know. That, do I have a second one. I may not have a second one I can use. Any kind of pot of work. You know, yeah, I have a little teeny one. This will this will do. So let's cheat a bit. That's right. We're hacking, dude. We're cheating. <sighs> the rest of the one thing, we're doing something else. We're making it. We got it. Yeah. All right. So Red Hat, 1994-95. Yeah. So the, the installation process of installing Red Hat was either dead, dead simple, straightforward, choose option A, just install everything, which literally installed everything. It installed MySQL, it installed Postgres, it installed Bind, it installed Apache, it installed MATLAB, it installed like uh, GNOME, um, everything. With four CDs worth of stuff got installed. Um, and the trouble with that, I didn't know at the time, being like a 15-year-old kid or whatever, um, was that a lot of the stuff that I was installing was just completely chock full of problems, uh, specifically Bind. And if you go back in the 90s and you look at Bind vulnerabilities, uh, one of them, and I don't recall off the top of my head which CVE it is or uh, how to easily go find it, um, it, how did you get MATLAB for free? How did I get MATLAB? I think it was like a, it wasn't the 90s, like the time of shareware. <laughs> it, it sure was. That was back before we were trying to monetize everything as well as we've done it now. Yeah. <laughs> I, lo I like that. Like literally Microsoft Word has a subscription model now. Oh, you want to use Word? You got to pay me monthly. Thanks, Microsoft. Uh, yeah, that's what everybody wants. Recurring I revenue. Know. It's terrifying. But yeah. Um, so I'm gonna add more butter. Um, you, mo butter. You. Mo butter is mo better. It is. Um, we'll do. Because we're gonna need it anyway. Oops. We'll need to emulsify with flour to get that tasty, tasty sauce. But yeah, so anyhow, uh, this was me like as a kid running Windows 95. Um, and before Windows 95, uh, just DOS and using programs like LCOM and Procom Plus to dial into BBSs. And at some point, uh, when Windows became interesting around 95, uh, people were pressuring me to get on IRC. And I would dial in to my local ISP and get on IRC through Windows. And uh, they would see that because I was using MIRC, which was like the de facto standard Windows client for IRC. And uh, uh, my friends on IRC convinced me to try Red Hat for the first time. And I did. And I seemed to enjoy it. Um, and these are also a bunch of 16-year-old kids. And they had no fucking clue what they were doing. So similar to me. They would just say like, oh, just do the, the low complexity college next version of installing Red Hat, which is just select the install everything mode. So I did. And uh, that ended up installing Bind. And then at one point, I'm on, I, I'm on IRC. Uh, and, um, God, I was at FNet at the time. And uh, that's fun. Um, A buddy of mine says, oh, you have bind installed. And I'm like, what? He said, you have bind installed. I'm like, I don't understand what you mean. <laughs> like, your grammar is broken. I did not realize that bind was the name of a piece of software. Uh, I thought it was like the verb to bind. And I'm like, I, I don't get what you're trying to tell me. <clears throat> and he's like, you have this thing installed. Let me show you. And then my computer rebooted. And when it came back, I was like, my computer just rebooted for some random reason. 
what is it you were going to tell me about? And he goes, oh, hold on a second. And then my computer rebooted again. Oh, and by the way, I'm, if it's not obvious, I'm, I'm chucking the mushrooms in. <laughs> so, yeah, I say that. so I'm making mine with mushrooms and ham. So I got an uncured ham, so I'm throwing that in right now to saute, and then I will add my mushrooms in. Okay. I have I have ham and provolone as well, but I'm going to – I suspect that I probably don't need to cook those necessarily. I'm just going to fold them into the crepes as sort of add-ons after it's all done. But yeah, so anyhow. So my buddy's telling me like, oh, you have you have Bind installed, and I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about. He needs my computer reboot a couple of times, and when I come back the second time, he's like, yeah, you should probably uninstall Bind, and I'm like, stop and back up. I'm 15. What is this? Explain. And he basically said, all right, look, so Bind is what's called a name server, and I'm like, what's a name server? And he's like, never mind. You're running software that I can fuck with over the internet, so maybe you should uninstall it so that other people can't fuck with it because. I made your computer reboot, but other other people can do much more terrible things. And I'm like, show me. So he did. And back then, this was the time of when you dial into the internet, your direct your computer is directly connected to the internet. There are no firewalls. Your ISP is not blocking anything. You have layer two adjacency to everyone that's on the same ISP as you. Like people can just mess with you, and there's no accountability. And for a 15-year-old kid, this is like being told that you you now have God mode. So uh, having learned that I could identify stuff on other people's computers and make them do things without their consent uh, was a, a, like, it was like giving a 15-year-old kid a spaceship. So I just started investigating other random crap that I could do and got into the whole like AOL punter slash booter thing and downloaded back orifice and the whole <laughs> like full on script kitty i had no fucking clue what i was doing um but you know 15 year old kid no car stuck at home for the summer with a computer and a modem yeah it was interesting times and then uh after that uh, my problem was that man overboard my man wow I'm terrible at this um my my problem became that uh I started looking for a job in like 1998 and um, one of the things that I discovered was that um, there really weren't like security jobs in, in 98 or 2000 even like security wasn't a job that you could apply for. So my thinking was that I could just get a sysadmin job that was heavily focused on security and I didn't do so well in that like that, those attempts because um, security wasn't a concern. Nobody seemed to care. It was this brand new thing that nobody really had any interest in dealing with. So um, I ended up being like a sysadmin that just was really into security and made other people uncomfortable um, until like 2008 when I just table flipped and quit a, a consulting job and started my first consulting or my first consultancy. So I've always sort of kind of taken stuff apart to see how it works. Um, but I didn't officially go into the field of security until 2008. What happened with that first consultancy? What was it named? Uh, A10 Labs. It was me doing a bunch of um, basically really simple forensic stuff for WordPress blogs that kept getting popped. Because people would install WordPress and then not change the credentials. And um, amusingly, as it is a 12-year-old problem now, um, people are still experiencing the same problems where they install a thing and never change a password and wonder why they got hacked. Um, so I did that for a while. Uh, and I started to get a bit of a name for myself doing sort of like intro 101 style pen test type deals where I was telling people how to do super basic security um, until corporations started to notice and started to ask me to, to come around. So what uh, stopped you from doing that? What happened to A10? Um, no, no, nothing. Um, I ended up getting a bunch of consulting jobs at Intuit. 
And then I got a consulting job at Semper Energy, which is like the power company around here. And then after that, uh, a buddy of mine who worked at Twitter got me to come and work at Twitter. So I worked there for a year. And then after Twitter, I worked for Rapid7 for like eight months. And after that, I got asked to be uh, one of the first three people in a startup that did security consulting. I did that for almost three years. And then that can, that company kind of caved in on itself. And uh, then I took the talent from that company and started Phobos. So me and me and my co-founder came from this previous consultancy. I definitely need more butter. So I'm kind of going to town on the butter. Hey, you'll only regret it in 30 years. <laughs> I just do some more pull-ups. So I guess what I'm gonna do now is, uh, it looks like the onions and the the, onion, the shallots and the uh, onion or mushrooms are ready uh, to be turned into a sauce. So I'm melting a bunch of butter, two, two more tablespoons of butter, and then I'm gonna chuck in a, a single tablespoon of flour, and then um, maybe a cup and a half of milk. And if I do this right and I don't fuck it up, I'll actually get a fairly decent little saucy sauce. Yeah, so uh, another way to do this is um, saute your vegetables and then make your roux separately. Um, the key to a roux, just butter, flour, add a little bit of flour, stir, add a little bit of flour, stir. Um, yeah. it, it's much more complicated when you're trying to do it with a whole bunch of other things. So, well, and you can also make a roux melt the cheese, and then add it into the vegetables and the herbs separately. Hmm. Yeah, the whole, my wife is considerably better at this part than I am. <laughs> Catch myself on fire. <laughs> Would you like wine? Because there's wine. Oh, is that your wife? She's hiding. Oh, come on, bring her on. Tell her it's the crazy guy you've known for a few years now. I just got home from work. It's the unicorn guy. He's normal. <laughs> no, not working. Yeah, Look, I'm 99% to... unicorn. <laughs> not intrigued? Not at all? No, I I have a feeling it'll take another couple of glasses of wine. <laughs> I'm going to try my little trick oh all right i just uh gravity is a thing the force yeah. that sucks that was all my cheese excellent guy with the knife it's what happens when i'm trying to like put everything together for the show yeah everything close on top of each other as opposed to a little more spread out like i normally do it i am looking forward to doing this again presuming i don't make such an ass of myself i don't get invited back for like round two <laughs> the, the next kitchen because the next kitchen has it's three times as big and i have a a fancy hood that the previous owner of the house put in and it's magnetic so i can i figured out how i wanted to do it like i figured out how i can um have uh, a magnetic mount um with a gopro because apparently the gopro hero 8 was released recently and GoPro's intention with that device was to make it so that you could stream with it. And you'd think that like, if you had the foresight, which you'd have to be a literal time traveler for this, but like, um, if they if they knew that there were gonna be nationwide or worldwide riots, that uh, if people could just have a GoPro and stream from a GoPro, that would be a really awesome, proof is in the pudding kind of thing for GoPro. But uh, I don't think that they, uh, I don't think that's their target market. But uh, the idea is like, they have this harness you can buy for a GoPro that's like 80 bucks. It's like this little plastic bezel that goes around the outside. It's got a boom mic and it's got an HDMI out port. And you can take the camera, pull the battery out, give it USB power and HDMI out, and then put it on a mount, and then it acts like a, a 4K HDMI camera. 
then they make mounts that have magnetic bases. So the theory would be that you could stick the camera onto the hood above your your, your cooktop and um, have top down. Roo. Oh, so, oh yeah. So here's, yeah, what I, yeah. This is what I'm doing. I got my little roux at the bottom. Yeah. Oops. So just butter, just adding in. You see how it's getting nice and foamy. Yeah. Just kind of keep adding it in so it gets a little bit thicker. Yep. I'm doing the same thing. It's just I've got the the skillet set to two different sides. And I should, I should get my cup and a half of milk out. There we go. That's nice and thick. Even a little bit. Um, Oh, that is, that's all right. Yeah, I think. I'm going to do my, I got my roux. I'm going to add my cheese to melt into my roux. Oh, I got to get my cheese out. So I'm doing uh, chopped provolone, gruyere, and parmesan. Um, Fine gruyere gives it a nice melt. Yeah, I'm aiming for the same, but I have like this like sandwich style provolone. A little bit of milk all together. All right. There we go. Got a nice creamy cheese sauce. Well, a more milk. There you go. Hopefully, I didn't fuck it up. Ain't no thing. All right. Nice cheese sauce coming together here. Oh. <laughs> I'm just telling you that moment when you see like the roux and the cheese all starts to melt together, it starts to look like a, a fondue. Yeah, when it becomes uniform, that's how you know you did yeah. it right. I'm uh, <laughs> I'm uh, I'm getting a Pavlovian effect here. <laughs> yeah, I'm following suit. I'm just a little ways behind. I'm slowly adding milk to the butter and flour mixture and then i'm going to fold all the veggies into it but i'm doing it all in one pan i don't know if you can see it very well but like yeah, the bottom half is the sauce so there you go cheese sauce nice So do you flip your crepes? What's that? Do you flip your crepes? <laughs> I turn them over any way I can. Oh, well, if you want, I can give you like a sort of crepe flip boot camp. All right, yeah, please do. I flip my crepes and the part of the trick is like this, this skillet has, um, you see the edges are beveled. They're like at an angle uh -huh. as opposed to like this skillet where the edges are almost straight up. Okay. So the thing that helps a lot if you want to do uh, flipping of anything is you want the edges of your skillet to be more, yeah, there you go. That'll probably work. Yeah. Um, because you can still do it on these other skillets. It's just a bit more of a pain. In the so I think I can hold stuff in at this point. Well, let me know when we're ready to make our crit mixture. All right, so I want to do two bits of provolone. And then I'm going to put my knife go. Got my eggs. Got my, well, it was pre-melted. 
<laughs> it's solidified. Sitting there. Ooh. Uh, a potentially un well, I don't know how unspoken it is. I don't spend a lot of time with actual chefs, but when you're grating the Parmesan, you can tell you're getting into crystals on the inside of the cheese. It tends to indicate there's a lot of flavor in there. An indicator of nom, if you will. All right. Hold everything together. Hopefully, I haven't fucked it up. Oh, it's so good. <laughs> good noises. It's turning goopy now. It's good. One of the things that they say that you should do a lot, that I haven't done yet, is taste as you go. Yep. Taste because as you go. Uh, yeah. If you don't, if you you could fuck it up ten steps ago and you'd never know. But yeah, this is this is the cooking equivalent of reading your logs. <laughs> Needs salt. And I'm going to add a thing that is not a specialty item. More mushroom flavor. Oh, God, that is so good. Seriously, dude, let's get some crazy going. I'm starving. Have you ever seen this stuff before? I'm sorry for the backwards text. Yes, you and I uh, talked about that two months ago. Yes, this stuff is fantastic. And if you ever, like, I put this stuff in the bag when I'm making filet mignon in the sous vide. If you want yeah. to add mushroom flavor to anything, this is basically just liquid cost. Like, you know how they make liquid smoke? This is the equivalent of, like, that, but for mushroom flavor. Yeah, no, um, remember, uh, I uh, I found that it was available in uh, Williamsburg. Yeah, that's right. And here I am, like a chunk. Uh, like... Here I am like a chump flying to England and like leaving space in my luggage to loot it when I go visit family in England. All right. Bit of salt, bit of mushroom ketchup. This should be good and I think this will pass my wife's test. Do you want to come and sample this stuff? No. She's hiding off camera. Yeah. She is the wizard for this component of meals. So we'll see how, I mean, it looks from a texture perspective, let's see the camera, there you go. Um, it looks okay. Like it's, it coats the back of a spoon. Um, it'll cool a little bit and it'll thicken a little bit, which will be nice. But I think um, it's a little bit more liquidy than my last go around, which is perfect, I think, because from a plating perspective, it should make the presentation look pretty good. And uh, one of the sort of cheat codes, are, I'm gonna set that, the sauce aside because I'm going to call that done another taste test. But um, for shooting food porn, um, like, it's where you have to marry, like, your skills as a photographer and your skills in the kitchen. Yeah. <laughs> that's, oh, my God. That's, you're going to like this. <laughs> um, I have a dark cutting board, which... For anyone in the audience that's ever seen my food porn pictures on Instagram or Twitter. Um, it's like this cutting board, but it's like dark wood, like walnut. I don't think it's actually walnut. Um, the more contrast you have, like the, the more net, oh, the first talking point there is the fewer adjustments you can make to your photos, the better you are as a photographer. And two, if you can find a way to introduce natural contrast, uh, it makes whatever the subject of your photo is pop a bit more. So if the subject of your photo is light in color and you have a dark cutting board, it looks better because it's showcased more. 
and vice versa. If you have a dark subject, you want a light cutting board. So if you shoot a lot of food porn and I shoot a, a scientifically precise fuckload of food porn, having different colors of cutting boards is really helpful in that regard. So the uh, grape batter. Uh, Alton Brown's recipe is slightly different than mine. Um, but mine, I can't remember where I got I, some Google query, um, but I found an easy one that I could commit to memory, right? So one level, one cup of flour, and then um, one cup of, do I have one cup of milk left? Oh, it's half, okay, so this is perfect. So this is the remainder of the milk that I didn't use. I ended up using a whole cup of milk in the sauce, and there's half a cup remaining. So half a cup of milk and then half a cup of water. Sorry for being off camera. Right. right. So it's easy to remember uh, a one-to-one -one ratio of what to dry. So one cup of liquid and one cup of solid. And in this case, the liquid is half and half water and milk. And then one egg. Hey, I did the one hand thing. Cool. Um, that one met. But uh, that and a pinch of salt. Which? Do you have a salt pig? We have a salt pig. What's a salt pig? A salt pig is a container in which you keep your fancy finishing salt and. This salt pig is almost empty, but uh, it's literally just a salt. Um, and we use this Malden's, uh, this Malden's sea salt brand, which is uh, very light in flavor. It's not very punchy salt, which is pretty great because as salt goes, like salt is like, it's kind of like getting a haircut or kind of like using profanity uh, a little bit. Uh, it will go a long way, um, but you can you can overdo it, and if you overdo it, you can't go back. So the idea with using a lighter flavor of salt or a lighter concentration of salt, I guess, uh, is that um, you can always add more salt, but it's difficult to like control Z if you've added too much. So by using salt as opposed to like Morton's or whatever table salt, um, you get a wider margin of error, which I find helpful because I go through life as an idiot and I, I tend to find that having a wider margin of error is helpful in a lot of, a lot of places. All right. Is this loose enough? I want this a little bit looser, so I'm going to add a tiny bit of water. All right, I added maybe a tablespoon. So for me, I like my um, crepe batter kind of runny because I tend to like thinner crepes because while crepes are tasty in themselves, they are basically just a platform on which the flavor goes. So what I tend to do is I'll make the sauce stronger and the, the thing lighter so that when you put them together, everything sort of evens out. I need a ladle somewhere. Okay. Got a ladle. And then tend to start with uh, I'll chuck a half a tablespoon of butter in the skillet because one of the things that uh, I've discovered is uh it is possible to overdo it with butter, but like, it's a challenge. Right. So, uh, at this point, I'm just greasing the skillet. So the first crepe always comes out kind of weird. I'm gonna move some stuff around real quick. I've been, 
alcohol abuse. I've been avoiding my wife. Still trying to get her on camera. There's wine. You'd like it. What are you drinking? Uh, butter bomb, buttery bomb. Well, there's most of a bottle left. Yeah, I am a valley girl. I should let my hair down, but then it'll make it into the food and it'll get really gross really fast. Here, I'll pour you a glass. Or I can pour you a mug. Yeah, but you have a glass of wine over here. Here, here's a glass of wine. Okay, well, then it's going to sit there and taunt you. Right, so um, I've let the butter go a little bit, which has turned it into brown butter, which is flavor, which is really good. Um, what I tend to do is I, I need a place to put these things when I'm done. I'm gonna put this here and I'm gonna get myself a plate, the finished crepes. Okay, uh, I tend to aim for uniform crepes, but I don't always do it right. Um, and then uh, I let them sit for a second to get the the initial point of contact where the, the batter touches the skillet to stick. And I can sort of just pan them around. And ideally, I just kind of go in a circle and I want to get as much coverage as I can. It looks kind of stupid. I know the white balance is fucked, but like that's what it looks like now. All that brown is brown butter. Um, so again, the first crepe is always weird, but the first, I think the first crepe's purpose in life is to just help make sure that the entire skillet is covered in butter. <laughs> I think that the first crepe is there to remind us of our humanity. Ordinarily, I would have some quip about how it's Friday and what are you doing talking about philosophy? What the fuck is wrong with you? But like, it's Tuesday or something? No, it's Wednesday. Oh my God. Yeah, see how easy that just moves? Yeah, so um, if it's done right, it'll just slide around. If there's enough butter, like once once the batter hardens enough, it's just sort of loosey-goosey in the pan. And you want to give it a maybe a minute or two. You can tell, it's, I apologize for the brightness. Maybe I can... We're good. No, it's good. We can see it. Yeah, but it's it's too white. It's being washed out, and I can't. Yeah, the, the white the white is definitely white. Yes, it's 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 blown out. But like that's what it looks like when it's not blown out. Yep. Yeah. So uh, when it turns mostly solid but looks undercooked, it's no longer wet on top. You can you can flip it, assuming that you get a little bit of air under it. Oops. See how badly I fucked this up in the first go. Uh, it's too stuck. So like. You can kind of, you can feel it out to see, like, will it behave? Will it let you flip it um, by just letting it slide around? If it feels like it's too stuck to the skillet, um, it, it won't flip. If you try and flip it, it'll fold on itself or, you know, like, it'll break in half or something like that. But um, at some point, you get to the point where, yeah, it's quite there yet. I'm already, already fucked it up. I think it's too heavy. Oh, there we go. Kind of had to manhandle it, but first flip. Yeah, the next ones will be easy. You get in this bizarre routine. Like, there's a relationship between the temperature of the batter and the temperature of the skillet. The first one is always weird, but um, once you get one or two down, they just they just it turns into a, a bit of an assembly line. Oh yeah, see it's a lot oops. A little looser now. Uh, and you saw my spatula flip there, just pull it out. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's see if I can do it again. Um if you want to see the technique, I've tried to aim the camera at it. But the idea is you want to like, you want to use the end of the skillet as a ramp. So you mm -hmm. want to like 
kinetically shove the crepe forward and have it launch itself forward and up and then it'll naturally sort of tilt towards you and then you can catch it with the skillet again so if you've done it right um oops there, there you go well, look at that yeah and the first one's a little weird because this one's a bit thick but that's the trick the trick isn't you don't want to go up you want to go forward and you want to use the front of the skillet as a ramp so if you want to try for the first time make it a, a little silver dollar sized one and practice on a little baby crepe and not a big one um, and just make sure that the top is cooked through enough that it's not liquid because if you try it and it's still liquid it just fucking goes everywhere and it's gross it'll smell great but it'll be shitty cleaning it up yeah first crepe a little bit of a alien one wet egg what the fuck is this kind of thing going on but I find that generally speaking, I don't need to top up the butter every single crepe. I only need to top up the butter every like third or fourth. And you can tell, after you do this enough times and you can tell um, by the way that the crepe behaves when you shove the skillet forward and backwards, how it adheres to the surface of the skillet you can tell whether you have enough butter or not. If it feels like it's sticking too much, you don't have enough butter. If it feels like it's so loose and sliding around that it's gonna jump out of the pan if you don't treat it right, that's exactly where you want it to be because that's how you get to where you can flip it easily. So now it's, and one of the ways that I test is I'll just, I'll pick up the skillet. Nice, well done. Um, and I'll, I'll shake it back and forth a little bit. And if the crepe doesn't naturally come loose, it needs another 10, 15 seconds on the heat. And I think I may actually have the heat too high because I can't, probably can't see it, but you can see the maybe the edges. You see how they're curling away from the skillet? That usually means that this, the heat is too high and I'm gonna have trouble flipping it. Ah, almost, I can hear it. Pretty sure what happens is that the butter underneath starts to turn into vapor. And then you get this layer of vapor between the the crepe and the pan. Good. Uh, nice. Oof. Oh. There we go. I gotta hold on for your first one so we can get our uh, screenshot of us uh, sharing our first crepe. Our first crepe. I'm gonna top up my butter a bit. Well, that's gonna make flipping a lot easier. There we go. Nice. It's a, a good color. I need to do something about the, I can't edit, it's unfortunate that I can't edit the camera, the camera brightness on the fly. I wonder if I could just, can I do this, no, this, stuff like that. No, now it's just too dark. <sighs> there, an hour. Is your Someday first one slide. up? What now? Is your first one up? Uh, it's on the plate. Oh, okay. Kind of a monster. Um, ooh. Yeah. All right. Well, um, I'm taking a bite. I'm I'm ruining our picture here because I got to eat <laughs> something. Well, no, that's cool. If, if we're if we're waiting for pictures, then um, mm. uh, we can do the second one. Here. Uh, let me pop this second or the third crepe in. And then while that thing's cooking, I'll plate up the, I'll plate something up that's photo worthy. Good enough, you can wait. Plate. Grape. 
killing. Round. And then I am a fan of quartering it. So what I'll do is I'll fold it in half once and then fold it in half again. And then you have this sort of pie, pie slice kind of shape going. And then there's a, so you got this kind of thing happening. It's still too bright. Um, and if you want, just for the sake of posterity, you do a little dollop on top. And then you see if I can do this fast enough that I can handle the next crepe. Then you you do up some Parmesan, and your first plating is like, you know, I don't have any green. Ooh, this is oh, it's ready. Yeah, the loot. All right, cool. First plating. <laughs> All right, we got it. Yeah. Uh, well, are you are you hungry? Because there's crepes. Okay, let's see how this turned out. Much better than last time. The sauce came out, which I'm very pleased about because that's the, the whole roux thing is something that I need to practice with. Yeah, so like I said, on the roux, do it in a separate pan. Just it allows you to focus on the butter and the flour coming together, and then you can fold in anything else you want once you got your roux where you want. Yeah, in this case, I did it all in one skillet, but surprisingly, it turned out. Hmm. That's yummy. And this might be all right. Oh, these are, nice clip. Do these qualify as French tortillas? <laughs> I would not say that to the French. I think they might be offended. What are they going to do? Surrender at me? <laughs> I have like three friends that would stab me if they heard that. <laughs> Which I'd be okay with because one of my mottos is no brain, no pain. Yeah. All right. Well, do you have any uh, last words of wisdom as we close this out since we have made a couple of crepes here? Um, I always have extra, like I have like this recipe that I use the one-to-one, -one, like one cup of flour to one cup of wet. And that wet is half and half water and milk and one egg that makes like six or seven crepes. So if your intention is to feed like two or three people, you're going to have leftover crepes. So plan on using like, think of making like this much sauce for crepe Suzette or like, um, make a, a a spread with Nutella or something and have like a dessert crepe set aside. Like a, a one or two crepes set aside to be dessert crepes. Yeah, I guess we're eight minutes over, aren't we? It's all right. Probably something works. tells me that people aren't like rushing to rushing off to their next meeting at like, it's like 10 o'clock? There's, no. my, there's my, my next one. Oh, nice. Yeah, I was gonna do ham and cheese as well, but those are still in the fridge. I tend to, I'll do those like on a per crepe basis. Like, mm -hmm. I would put the ham and the cheese in the crepe and fold it up, and then treat it like a half moon, like a like a giant taco, um, to get all the come on the flavors to melt. There we go, the flavors to melt together a bit. There we go. All right. Well, I hope everybody enjoys making their crepes at home. Um, yeah. Post pictures. Hashtag Chef Bryson. Hashtag Hacker's Kitchen. And do not forget to donate to National Bailout to help make a difference in mm -hmm. um, everything that's going on in the world today. Um, again, Bobos will match the yep. first $3,000 in donations. That's right. Dan, thank you. Cheers. Yeah, of course. Until next time. Until next time. Take care, man. All right, man. See ya.